The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to talk about the art of composting and house plants, what you may want to purchase for your home, as well as author Eva Monheim. And we'll answer your garden questions. The hour is jam-packed, and it starts right now. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the Internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Welcome to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Happy you're being part of the program today. I am your host, Joy Barrett. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner, Holly Barrett. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow indoors and out. If you want to be part of the program, you can do that by uh, two simple ways. One is giving us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-7469. If you can't get through to us during the show, you can certainly leave us a message and we will call you back um, toll-free, coast-to-coast. If you'd like to email us, you can do that at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. If you're sending us a question in regards to a problem and you have uh, certainly attached photographs, if you're capable of doing that, so we can help better identify the problem that you're facing. And uh, that will make things a lot easier on our end and uh, help the answer uh, better fit the problem. So, Holly, let's get into the program. We're going to talk about the art of composting. There are really three different types of composting. There's anaerobic, aerobic, and vermicomposting. Right. So that kind of breaks down to hot composting, cold composting, and worm composting. Right, right, right. I mean, if you want to break it down to simpler terms. Now, aerobic composting is a process of whether you're using a tumbler or a pile, but you are incorporating a lot of air, a lot of oxygen into it. You're turning it on a regular basis, whether mechanically in a tumbler or, you know, with a compost uh, mixer or by hand with a pitchfork or a shovel, but you're forcing air into the compost pile, which helps speed up the breakdown process. Now, side note, if you're incorporating a lot of weeds and weed seeds into your compost pile, the aerobic process is the best process because it's going to heat the pile up and get to a level in which it's going to kill the viability or the germination of those seeds. That's the one that is the hot compost. Right. And so with that, you want to have a ratio of 30 to 1, carbons to nitrogen. 30 is the carbon and 1 is the nitrogen? Correct. Because we've always heard the, oh, 50-50 ratio, 50-50 ratio. That's kind of been the, the, the default of making compost. What do we put in it? 50-50. That's what you do. But in order to get a better breakdown process, because the green material, the nitrogen, is moist, it has a lot of moisture, whether you're using your old watermelon rinds or grass clippings or kitchen scraps, whatever the case is, there's a lot of moisture going into that. You don't want your pile to be soggy. You want it to be damp like a sponge. Right. You want it to, yeah, to be damp like a sponge and you want it to get warm enough where it's going to break that down and uh-huh. it has something to eat. Right. Uh, the yeah. core temperature to kill seeds that you don't want to germinate is, I, I think it's, I'm, I, 170 degrees for 72 hours or something like that. But you will get these piles and these manufacturers of compost, they do in giant windrows. We had a, a company many years ago that sponsored some of our video productions, and they had windrows. They were about 12 feet wide, 10 foot high, and about a couple of hundred feet long of leaf compost. And they those piles got so hot that they actually cooked a turkey in the center of that pile in the dead of winter. So these piles get very hot. Obviously, the, the, the determination on how hot your pile gets is, one, the material that you've put in that pile, and two, the size of that pile 
that you've put that material in. The size of a 55-gallon drum, not going to get nearly as warm as the size of a uh, minivan. So keep that in mind whenever you're manufacturing or creating your compost in your backyard or on your property. Did you know that compost is about 20% oxygen? No, I didn't. Yeah. So your compost, as long as it's, uh, I guess, properly composted, right? it's about 20% oxygen. That's okay. a lot of oxygen, I think. And then let's talk about the aerobic compost or the lack of air to the compost. This is considered the cold composting or what we know every day as landfill composting. They throw the stuff in, they cover it up, it creates a methane gas, and then they have to vent that out. Otherwise, you know, explosions can happen and, and cool movie stuff can happen. But in real life, that's not so fun. Um, this also occurs if you I are, mean, it could be fun as long as you're not responsible Well, n- now what they're doing with this methane is they are capturing it instead of burning it off because it's such a valuable fossil fuel now. I guess it's a fossil fuel. I don't know. It's such a valuable... There's money behind it. Because there's money behind something, that's when things start happening. Oh, we're burning the methane off. We could capture that and sell that to residents for heating, and that's what they're doing. So um, methane, the the aerobic process, the the lack of air, it's not that there's no air in it. It's just not mixed in like the aerobic. Right, and this is basically where you're just having... A compost pile. You just keep throwing it on. So whether it be like a bin you have in your backyard or you just have a pile or you create something with like pallets, whatever, um, this is something that you just you just keep throwing out. Whatever it is, you might mix it once a year. You might dump it out to get the good compost and sift it. But this is not like a, a 30 to 1 ratio. This is like 10 to... 90 what, yeah, or whatever. Who knows, yeah. who knows right? It, because we've done it. We've done the cold compost where we've had, you know, literally a foot of weeds and then two foot of leaves and kitchen scraps and it breaks down. All of the above. But right. it doesn't, you know, kill those viable seeds that so, weed seeds. So this is what we do. I'm sure people listening probably are like, well, what do you do with this weedy, it, seedy yeah, compost? Yeah, it's compost, so, but we've got weed seeds So in. what we do is we take... And we put it at the bottom of things. So the bottom of like a raised bed, bottom of those 60-gallon grow bags. Is it 60 gallon? Yeah, 60 gallon. 60 gallon and grow bags from yep, Root Maker. Right um, and we use it like that. You, we could even use it as possible fill for things. So and lumps, what, and lumps and bumps in the yard. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of options for that. Um, that and it's a – I feel like, yeah, I, ideally – I would like to do hot composting. But is that ideal for us? No. But we are still composting. Right. And you get the ad- air, your, you get the anaerobic process uh, for those who are familiar with uh, livestock or, or farming in the cattle lot where the cattle or, or the hay bale sets. It sets there all winter long and then you go in there in the spring. Farmers, some of you, you know, if you're in downtown uh, Pittsburgh, you're not doing this. So I, I'll explain it. Uh, where the cattle feed the hay at, they sit there and they eat and they defecate and, and it piles up. And then they, there's a certain amount of loss of hay. So that gets cleaned up in the spring and it's very anaerobic because it's been compressed. There's no oxygen. So the farmers pick it up and put it in a device called a manure spreader. They take it to the field and it spreads out and it, they basically feed the, you know, it's like a fertilizer. Uh, that That's what it is. But I remember that smell is very potent. It's a very methane smell because it cannot escape. Uh, that area so that's an anaerobic now we talk verma compost so verma composting is worm composting and there's two benefits to worm compost you get the the worm tea and mm-hmm. you get the worm uh the the, the verma compost or the the, the worm, compost. Wor- worm castings right and we talked about this a few shows back um and this is using these but you're not okay so just to clarify yeah let's start from the beginning we got time let's yeah, yeah. You're not going to go out to your, your yard and dig up worms and put them in a composting bin and ta-da, worm a You're, you're going to do that one time and they're all going to die. Yeah, they're, gonna, they're all going to die. And then your your fishing friend will be like, you just got lost all this bait. So you want to use composting worms. And where do you get composting worms? Typically online. Mm-hmm. They send them and then you have Cousins comp- Compost uh, has that available to you. By using uh, coupon code REDWORM21, and you can save 
uh, 10% off your order, and you can get composting worms, composters, and uh, everything you need for worm composting from CousinsCompost.com. Right. So you set up you set up a bin with a lid, and you can use anything from like a styrofoam cooler. That's what most people use because it allows you to um, to layer. It has enough room to layer different things. The compost, the a carbon base, so that would include like newspapers or a shred of paper, um, some some soil, and and then your food scraps and your worms. And so the less this, than, fewer on the citrus because they're right. not yeah yeah fewer on the citrus, and this is something that you would only add your compost once a day. So say you're like okay, well I had a banana for breakfast, and I have some tomato waste for lunch, and then I have uh, some carrot peels and zucchini peels for dinner. You would just um, kind of put those together, and then at the end of the day or whatever. You would add those because the more times you open the bin, it kind of disturbs the worms. And in order to make it easier for the worms to ingest these items, some people will get an El Cheapo blender from a secondhand store and they'll pulverize the material, add just a teeny bit of water in order to get it to process it, and then drapes it in the worm bin. And that is able for the worms to process it much quicker instead of eating a big leaf that you've thrown in there that you didn't finish with your salad. Right, or a whole banana peel. And, and w- if you have a salad, you want to be careful what oils you put in there. Oil, they right. don't like oil. There's a lot of things that you need to be aware of. But it can be a very easy way to compost indoors year-round, and the smell is very limited to none. So if you've got a, a basement or a climatized garage or even a side room, that uh, the smell is not going to be that potent, if any, you can certainly compost. And this is a great way for kids uh, to do as well. Or if you are are able to do such a thing, maybe like a a retirement uh, facility uh, of something sort like that. Yeah, you could do that in a lot of situations, especially uh, maybe something you want to do over winter, get started into the habit. And it's a way to kind of make Connect yourself to the earth in the dead of winter. So the art of composting, let, let's go over what we shouldn't compost. Now, this list is subject for debate, and your mileage will vary in your backyard and your property because the general rule of composting in a normal urban setting is no meat, no bones, no dairy. Now, if you have a 40-acre plot of land and you got a compost pile three quarters of a mile away from the house you can throw the meat you can throw the bones you can put the dairy in there the purpose of a lot of that do not do this is simply because it will attract rodents and scavengers like coyotes or wolves or foxes into your pile you don't really want that on the back porch but if your pile is very far away that will all eventually break down. And the digging around of these animals actually can help the breakdown process occur much quicker. With that being said, you want to make sure your pile is far enough away and you feel safe enough to do that. And uh, that's our disclaimer. Right. You have to you have to consider your own, I don't know, your own location, basically. Right, yeah. right. So that being said, uh, talking about foxes and wolves and coyotes and and all the scavengers, getting that time of year where uh, you will be hunting or it's time to butcher out the animals or you just want good spices, Walton's Incorporated has all of that and a whole lot more for you. Yeah, the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you today by our sponsor, Walton's Inc. Listen, we know you care about where your food comes from. Canning and preserving your fruits and vegetables is great. But what about the meat? What about the meat? At waltonsinc.com, you can get all the equipment, seasoning, and supplies to make sausage, jerky, and any other meat product your way to your high standards. Do you want to make snack sticks that people will actually like? Walton's created meatjustics.com, an informational site to help you make the best finished product. Walton's even has a full line of their own meat grinders, mixers, and sausage stuffers to help you go from animal to edible. Walton's is everything but the the meat. That's waltonsinc.com. And if you're not a meat processing individual, they've got all kinds of seasonings and spices and kitchen cooking utensils, and they've got a deal for you. If you go to waltonsinc.com and you use coupon code GROW22 at checkout, you can save 10% off 
your order of $50 or more and receive free shipping. That's waltonsinc.com. When we come back, it's about house plants. What should you put in your home? We're going to go over some options. You're listening to The Garden with Joey and Holly Radio Show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. We here at the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show Gardens understand that healthy soil is the key to a successful garden. We know that chemical fertilizer burns carbon out of the soil and kills the microbes needed for a healthy soil ecosystem. No worries. Chicken Soup for the Soil by Dr. Jims will stimulate life into your soil, supplying all the nutrients most fertilizers neglect. Rather than force-feeding water-soluble chemical fertilizer, we suggest feeding the microbes a smorgasbord of 100% biodegradable nutrients that your plants can consume when they need them. The nutrients are readily available to maximize their genetic potential. Chicken Soup for the Soil will increase the quality of the fruit and vegetables you grow. Visit drjims.com. That's dr. J-I-M-Z dot com. Number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code RADIO21 and get 15% off your entire order. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Straight from the farm, fields, and briar patch, Piper and Leaf Artisan Tea is a tea like you've never imagined it. Get our award-winning tea delivered right to your front door and become part of the Piper and Leaf family. Free shipping over $75 at Piper and Leaf. Com. Turf experts always say lawn season begins in the fall. It's the time to help grasses recover from summer stresses and thicken up so it can come back strong in the spring. This fall, you can fertilize, aerate, and dethatch your lawn using just one fantastic liquid product. It's called Lawn Force 5, a five-way lawn care kit in a bottle. Lawn Force 5 gives you a lush, healthy lawn you can be proud of. It improves your soil in a way that gives your lawn great color using 75% less nitrogen than typical lawn fertilizers. Visit our friends at natureslawn.com to find out more about this amazing Lawn Force 5 product. That's natureslawn.com. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Pro Plugger, Dripworks, Waltons Incorporated, Tree Diaper, Janie's Mill, Phylum Bioproducts, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Nature's Lawn and Garden Incorporated, Deer Defeat, Dr. Jim's, Root Maker. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome, Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. As fall reaches uh, through our backyards, Tree Diaper... Uh, did you not water very well this year? Tree Diaper is a device that can help you water better. And if you didn't have a good year this year, you should get a hold of Tree Diaper now so you can be prepared for next year. Tree Diaper is a revolutionary watering system that slowly releases water around the base of any tree or plant as the soil dries. The Tree Diaper is filled with water from rain or when you water and slowly releases water over three weeks. Every time it rains, Tree Diaper recharges. No pipes, hoses, or electricity needed. Water your plants and trees, whether they are by the house, down the road, or in the back 40. Also works under mulch. Whether you're a first-time gardener or advanced, Tree Diaper will improve the way you water your plants. Made in the USA, you can check out all the sizes they have available at TreeDiaper.com. That's TreeDiaper.com. Well, as winter, as fall comes and winter soon will arrive, uh, we're going to talk about house plants. 
And when, since most of us are now home, uh, whether working from home or home for other specific reasons, we want to look at what we can put in our homes to liven up our environment. Now, there, there's a YouTube channel called TKO Total. I, I forget what the name of it. Big, big channel. Uh, but they did an experiment um, of having a bunch of plants in a small room with a person in it for multiple hours to see if there was a level in the oxygen uh, in the air, and they kind of determined that you need a whole, whole lot of plants in order for that to take place. Now, it didn't determine whether or not it helped remove the toxins in the air, but just having house plants, edible or non-edible, it is a mental boost in the cold days of winter that we experience. Right. I, I agree. And it kind of gives you, there's a lot of different houseplant options. So you can put, you know, tuck plant, plants in many places. Which is dangerous because some people may not know what is the best for their home. They purchase one. It doesn't do well. And they get discouraged. Oh, I waste a lot of money. I don't know what I'm doing. Forget this. Right. And I think one thing that happens a lot with houseplants is people overwater them. Too much um, love. Too much, too much love. So you would you want to get in the habit of just watering it once per week, or you could purchase um, something or make something that is like a little self waterer or a moisture meter. A moisture meter so that you're not overwatering it. I know this would happen even when I worked in the office. People would say, "I have this little bit of water. Can I dump it in your plant?" And you I, do that twelve times yeah, a day, yeah. or you know, even just like four times a week. Right. And I would only water my plant, you know, once a week, and and it did really well. So you definitely want to keep that in mind. And with house plants, it's almost better to go on the schedule of not enough water rather than too much water, because then that eliminates the opportunity of a lot of fungal uh, root issues, uh, a lot of. A lot of different problems. Especially, Too much water is, is much more dangerous than not enough. Yeah, and that's one thing to keep in mind. So if you're like, oh, I'm so horrible at remembering the watering stuff. You're okay. House, <laughs> I mean, once you get past a point, probably not good, but house plants might be the, the best idea for you. So let's talk about a spider plant. Okay. Spider plants are great for removing formaldehyde from the air. And you're like, why is there formaldehyde in Too my much air? formaldehyde. <laughs> um, o- office so, office yeah. reference. Yeah. Um, it comes from all sorts of things like paper bags, wax paper, facial tissues, paper towels, napkins, um, particle board, plywood, synthetic fabric. So formaldehyde is kind of all around us. We don't realize it. And, and here's the thing. I'll give you. Uh, we look at history and there you can go and there's very different variables of why past generations lived much longer than current generations. Well, part of the thing, and I have no scientific proof beyond this, beyond my common sense, and that has, you know, sometimes you go and you know enough about enough things to get you in trouble on everything. But in today's society, what do we have? We have all kind of microwaves flying around with radios and, and cell phones, and we've got uh, every kind of toxicity and carpet and, and boards and wood and tape and glue that we're breathing all of this in on a regular basis, more exhaust in the, in the air and all this. We're not doing ourselves any favors, but there is some, I believe, correlation to why our great-great-grandparents lived to be 114, and now we barely can get to 83. That's, that's, that, that's your rant for the day. Brought to you by nobody but me. Okay. So anyway, back to, back to spider plants. Spider plants can be grown pretty much anywhere in your home, and they can... They can grow in any type of soil, so whatever soil comes in the container that they you got the spider plant in, as long as it doesn't outgrow the container, you can just leave it in that. Um, at some point, you might have to repot it. And is there a guide to knowing when the right time to up pot is the term to move that plant from a four to a six or that six to an eight? So this is what you want to do is when okay. you purchase that plant, you want to ask the person you buy it from. Okay. Or you can. Um, so like I would highly recommend going to a plant store, but you might, maybe you buy your plant from a big box store. That's grocery stores have these, right? Grocery stores. No shame in that. Just go online and do some research. Look at when you buy the plant before you purchase it, hold it in your hand and slightly gently remove the, the pot that it's in. And you can see how root bound that plant may be. And if the roots are nice and clean and bright and white, you're in good shape. If they're old, yucky and dark color, 
plants don't don't get that one. And right. and then you can up pot it. Now you don't want to go from a four inch to a twelve inch. You, two inches in it jump is plenty because it's going to take quite a bit of time for that plant to go and expand out and fill that six inch pot when it was in a four inch. So don't overdo yourself. Right, and I'm not I'm not plant shaming anybody, no. but there was plenty of people when I worked in the office whose plants were in a smaller pot than they should have been, and those plants lived just fine. It's like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's not ideal, but whatever. So spider plants, yeah, they are great plants. They require just enough water to keep the soil moist. That's all you need, and they're pretty pretty low maintenance. Low light condition, favorable? Yeah. Very, they're very favorable in the low light conditions. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, what's another one in which we can have? Or good advise people to have? Aloe vera. Aloe vera. So, <laughs> assuming your cat doesn't knock it off and 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 destroy a lot <laughs> on of the a plant. Saturday morning, yeah, yeah. Um, speaking from experience, so aloe vera, it's fun, fun plant to grow. Benefits, Pretty benefits. You know, you can use the aloe vera leaf, the stuff inside the leaf, medicinally to apply to your skin. I don't know what else you would use it for. Burns, like, yeah, burns. burns. I mean, burns. Yeah, like, apply it to your skin for burns. I've seen people put it on their face directly mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And you Do can your own research and, and you can whenever a pup or a, a second growth comes up, you can harvest that and cre and and put another create another plant with it. So, it will kind of propagate itself with some uh, care. And we purchased ours at a local garden center, independent garden center, and we made sure we had one that had two separate plants in it. We had one pot we paid I don't know six dollars for, but it had two plants in it, and that's the key. You're buying the pot. It doesn't say that you're paying per plant. So keep that in mind when you're doing a house plant situation or you're buying the six packs in the spring for your vegetables. If you can find a six pack that actually has eight or 12 because somebody dropped too many seeds in, hey, they're paying, you're paying for the six pack. Whatever comes in that six pack, that's bonus for you. All right. So English ivy is the next one we can talk about here. Um, it's, a, it's a great plant for the bedroom. Okay. Because it helps purif purify the air a little bit, kind of uh, filter the air, uh -huh. especially maybe if you have allergies or asthma and you think about sleeping at night and how that could help be beneficial. So that is one option for you. Um, so if you do have English, if you have children and pets, English ivy is poisonous. Okay. So if you have a, <laughs> if you have a little furry friend that likes to eat plants, probably not so much for your home. Okay. Lavender is another one which you can grow. Um, lavender, many people find it challenging to get it to germinate. We have probably a 80% success rate with lavender. We've never really had a very hard struggle growing it. And when we have grown it, we've grown it in one-gallon grow bags from rootmaker.com. You can use coupon code uh, radio 21 and save 15% on your order. Uh, they have one to 60-gallon grow bags. Works very well. Um, and you can grow that indoors. Uh, with minimal amount of uh, maintenance. So lavender is something that you can put it pretty much anywhere in your home and you can buy an established plant if you can mm -hmm. find one. Um, but they they do like lots of sunlight. So if you have a sunnier area, they do recommend putting it in your bedroom because lavender, the scent of lavender is naturally calming. Mm -hmm. So it could you know benefit you there. But maybe you have a stressful other area of your home that gets a lot of light. Buy you, two plants. Buy, <laughs> buy two plants. Uh, maybe you work from home now and right. you're like, I just need, I need something to smell to make myself feel better. And if that's the case and yeah. you can't get the, the lavender, you can get in a, 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 a few, uh, essential, essential oil. oils. Yeah. yeah. You can get it from uh, simply earth and you can, in, you know, let that aroma fill your work area if you want to do that. Now we've got a, a plant that we had in the studio and now we've moved it to other portions. We we have a studio in our home, so that's why we're referencing this. We've moved it in the kitchen on the uh, refrigerator. Now, what kind of plant is that? That's a monstera plant. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a large leafy plant. The leaves look like I don't know, tropical. Tropical. Yeah. 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 Um, and it was a plant, a type of plant I had always wanted. Uh huh. And so I purchased one. Right. You've had a lot of these. I've always wanted these. And I, I learned these after 10 years of marriage. I'm still learning things. <laughs> I've always wanted a cat named Tex. I've always wanted a monster. But as, so, yeah. Uh-huh. We well, continue to learn things. About each other. Yes. Yes. So, um, <laughs> 
So yeah, I have a monstera plant, and it's just fun and pretty, and and cool. it's it's dividing, it's growing yeah. very very well. We've got a south facing window, and the refrigerator is about uh, seven, seven, six, seven feet off that window, and it captures plenty of light. It really does very well well uh, on that. Uh, what else do we have? Our snake plant. Now, a snake plant, not. Uh, Oh yeah, snake plant. Sometimes I think they call it mother-in-law's tongue uh-huh. because oh, it, yeah. it's very flat and tall Point, and, pointy. and pointy. Right. Yeah. Um. So people put this kind of anywhere, and they can grow to be quite to it, quite large. It, to it, just... it, it more grows vertical rather than horizontal. It's yeah. very tightly plant. It's a very tight plant that grows straight up. Right. And so this is another one that is supposed to kind of improve indoor air quality. I would say any plant does that. To some level. To some level. Yeah. It, it's and, and even if it, it's even if it, you know, psychologically it helps as well. Just seeing the green, seeing that life in a pot next to the window or in a bedroom or something like that. Just psychologically it, it helps your mental state. Right. And I it, it does. And it definitely like even, you know, I have, um, well, unfortunately, RIP to my Calithia. Um, I had one in, in the office. I brought it home, and I think we actually cooked the roots. But um, that one was very nice to have because I would trim the leaves back and, you know, water and care for it. And the same thing in your home, just like your garden outside in your home. Maybe you don't, ha- you don't have an option to have a garden or you don't have as big of a garden as you want. You can do this in your home, and it's... It's fun, and with that plant, that the the one that no longer the Calithium. the Calithium, if you it depended on what type of water you watered it, and if you watered it wrong or too much, the leaves would roll right up, and then or or if it was too dry, the leaf you could watch the leaves move very rapidly. In well, one the leaves form. move because it's it because of the daylight, mm-hmm. but it also did that because of the water. Yeah, yeah, but it was it's it wasn't like you had to do a time lapse. You could sit there and watch that plant move, which was uh, a little unnerving if you're that type of person that kind of thinks plants come alive at night you know like toy story uh (laughs) well when i was in the office people would notice uh they would say your plant moves clearly they weren't working hard enough tonight you know yeah Yeah, well whatever so (laughs) well with that being said as fall is here and uh summer has gone uh, the nighttime temperature is getting cooler and we have forgotten about our lawn, and we can't do that because if we do that, we're going to have problems next spring with larvae. Right. So just like because it's fall, we don't want to forget about our yards. Those Japanese beetles, we don't want to forget about those either. They may be gone, but they're not far away. They feasted on your roses and berries this summer, but they also laid eggs in your turf so they can start again next year. You can take a stand with phylums, grub but gone. Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT granular that specifically targets those scarab pests and their larvae. You simply apply the granule with a spider irrigate into the soil and let the naturally occurring bacteria do its job. Not only is Grub Gone easy to use, but the best part about it, it's non-chemical and it's effective on controlling those grubs that will soon be those Japanese beetles in the spring. And it has zero toxicity towards bees and other pollinators, so you don't have to worry about them taking it back to their hives and toxifying and killing them. That's Grub Gone from PhylumBioproducts.com. Grub Gone, the natural choice. P-H-Y-L-L-O-M, Bioproducts.com. Hang out, don't go anywhere. Author, Eva Monheim will be with us. You're listening to The Garden with Joey and Holly, radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now, 1-800-927-SHOW. Tired of dealing with bugs but don't want to use harmful chemicals to repel them? Naturally Green No More Bugs is all natural and plant-based. No more chemical bug repellent. Use it around your home and on you, indoors and out. DEET free and will not stain. Repels mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, roaches, ants, flies, and more. No More Bugs is the answer to what is bugging you. Stop using harmful chemicals and use what is safe for you, your family, pets, and the environment. For more information, visit natgreenproducts.com. Natgreenproducts.com. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. 
Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Simply Earth, Seed Savers Exchange, Quick Snap Sprinklers, Water Hoop, Timber Pro Coatings, Bloom and Easy Plants, Pomona Universal Pectin, Ivy Organics, Tiger Torch, Happy Leaf LED, Seed Link. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. During these dry summer months, you will notice more aggressive yellow jackets flying around. Yellow jackets are looking for your barbecue meat, sweet drinks, as well as water sources. You can keep them at bay with rescued yellow jacket traps. Rescue yellow jacket traps are eco-friendly, do-it-yourself option to keep the stinging pests away from you. These traps are a powerful lure for yellow jackets and will not attract beneficial honeybees. You can find all rescue products that are made in the USA at rescue.com. That is rescue.com. Absolutely. Gardening with Joy and Holly Radio Show back with you. And Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Eva Monheim is a horticultural and environmental consultant and educator with a vast experience in the green professions. She is the co-founder of V, which is Verdant Earth Educators. She has contributed to many publications, and she's also an author. Her book is called Shrubs and Hedges. Welcome to the program, Eva. Oh, thank you, Holly and Joey. I'm delighted to be on your show. Well, we appreciate you taking time, and I think you're going to educate Holly and myself and all of our listeners, so we're excited for that. So what is V, uh, the Verdant Earth Educators, and what inspired it? Well, um, Verdant Earth Educators um, is a company that works with residential and commercial green industry clients. We do consulting on site to address planning, growth, sustainability, and diversity. And we also do garden coaching and employee training. Um, And this is a a really big area where... um, more and more companies are doing personal development for their staff and that's where we come in we'll train their staff we also write landscape management plans for homeowners and companies for the bidding process and for proper and and consistent care Um, and our teams do site analysis uh, on environmental design pruning safety training stormwater mitigation training And in addition to that, we also do plant ID, tree inventories, performance mulching, and show proper staging strategies for when companies are working on site. So what what inspired this? Was this something that you uh, created or you just became a part of? Um, No, my colleague Louise Clark and I, uh, well, actually she was a former student of mine at the university, And um, then afterwards, um, she was actually, I recommended her to work at the university because they needed a biology instructor. And she was excellent in biology because that's her background. She was a medical uh, technical person. And she moved into the horticulture field. And um, we were looking at different landscapes because we traveled together with the Garden Communicators International. And we would look at different sites and we'd say, look at that problem or Uh look at how that, how poorly that's done. And so what we did was we decided we were going to start a company that would empower people to do the right uh, methodology when they were planting a tree, not putting a mulch volcano, Uh pruning, pruning the branches correctly, um, pruning the shrub correctly, uh, empowering people. Um, to to actually help them. So it's from an educational standpoint, not everybody wants to go to college. Not everybody can afford to go to college. But to go and have a session one-on-one, like right now uh, we're doing family training. We, I go, we, uh, my one, our one client, I go to their house and just actually train the whole family. I'll be. Now, you, when you said that, you, you I knew you were going to bring up volcanic mulching because we yes. see that to be a very big problem with municipalities that are supposed to know better for people who don't know what that term means and maybe are doing it. Can you briefly go over what that term means and the damage in which it can cause a tree? Oh, sure. It's like having your foot in, in uh, plaster Paris and not being able to move it. Um, what mulch does is it 
when it's put up against the bark of the tree, it's put, put up against an area that needs to be exposed. So any place where there's bark on the tree that's hard, um, you want to leave it open to the air. And there is what we classify um, a root flare or foot to the tree. And that foot is um, there to help the tree uh, get thicker and it helps it to move in the wind. And that, that um, movement actually thickens the base of the trunk of the tree so that it can withstand heavier winds, uh, difficult uh, weather conditions and so on. So mulching high up on the tree actually causes disease and forces the tree to push out roots where they should be. And it destabilizes the main roots that are buried underneath this thick layer of mulch and then they can't breathe. And and you would and I would recommend and you could correct me, about one inch of mulch, three foot away from around the base of the tree, outward from the trunk, and that would be good enough and you don't have to worry about bumping in with the lawnmower or anything like that. Would you consider that to be a, a good starting base? Right. Yeah, you you want to keep the mulch away from the actual root mm -hmm. flare. But you're right. You want to have a, a thin layer of mulch on the overall um, covering of the root system. And when you do that, as you mentioned, you're not bringing the heavy lawn mowers over the roots to compress the, the roots, um, especially when the soils are moist or, or wet. You shouldn't really be mowing anyway, but sometimes you have to mow. And uh, that reduces the overall compression around the root zone. And you're right. That's, that's, that's what I would do. Yeah. Okay, well, you have a book. It's called Shrubs and Hedges. What inspired that book and what can our listeners expect or maybe like a intriguing tip to encourage them to pick up a copy? Well, the, um, the book has, has been inspired by my teaching at Longwood Gardens in Kenneth Square, Pennsylvania. I teach in their certificate program and the class I teach is shrubs. And it's a really fascinating course because most people don't ever look at a shrub as something that's at our eye level um, but it's it's a critical point within the context of a woodland or in the landscape because it, being able to see something at your own eye level makes you more aware of uh, activity that's happening and so if we have bees right in in line with our eyes we, we're more attentive to them um, so the whole idea of having a shrub book was was intriguing to me because people were asking lots of questions about shrubs that I just took for granted because I knew about. And so uh, the, the book came out and one of the areas that I talk about are hydrangeas. And uh, hydrangeas, we're like in the middle of the hydrangea craze since 2003 when the first endless summer hydrangea came out. Um, it prompted other breeders to breed better, better performing plants ones that have uh, greater color, larger heads, um, beautiful structures. And so now we're getting lots of different types of hydrangeas and the breeding continues. And I, I can see this going for the next 10 or 15 years down the line. And each year we get new ones. So in the, in the book, there's actually a chart that tells you when, when to prune it, if it needs to be pruned, when it blooms. Um, and there's about 75 different hydrangeas in the book. And I know that uh, several professionals have told me in the field that this is a really invaluable source mm. of information for anybody who is, is doing planting of hydrangeas in their gardens or uh, professionally in a public garden. So, so that's, yeah, that's one of the things that I have is that's, I feel is really important. So the, the hydrangea, because of competition, we were able now to enjoy so many different more types of beauty with the, with that particular type of flower or, or bush shrub hedge, uh, because not, because one company started and then there's everybody else said we got to be bigger and better. And now we've got a lot of great selections to choose from. We do, and we, we have the, some in tree form, like the hydrangea paniculata the, or the panicle hydrangea, and we have reblooming uh, arborescence, which is our native uh, hydrangea, and we also have some new ones coming on the aspara hy hy hydrangea. Uh, they're working on that. But the idea of having a range of different flower-type heads, you know, the round head, the flat, lacy kind, the lace 
cap, what they call lace cap, and of course the big panicles that you see on a tree-like structure. There's just so many out there and they're breeding them for smaller gardens, for containers, uh, to use as a small tree, rather than having a really big tree in your backyard, you can have a small tree of hydrangeas. So there's a whole range of them and you're exactly right. They One plant pr- prompted a whole cascade of breeding to happen. Now, let's talk about shrubs and bushes or hedges and bushes. What are some tips that you can offer homeowners before they go and just buy the first one they see when they walk in the garden center? What are some things that they need to consider before filling in a spot with just any old hedge or bush? Well, that's a really great question. Um, One of the things I really like to discuss with uh, people when I'm out on on the lecture circuit, I'll say, you know what, first of all, take a look at your garden and see where you might have a hole, where you want to have a visual, create a visual impact, a focal point, for example. And take a look at the size, measure it, go out and actually measure the space. See what the aspect or direction, like direction that you have there. Is it east, southeast? Is it west? How is it facing? And then once you have that information, you can go into a garden center equipped with how large of a plant you really need. And I always say, take, get a, get a, a use a larger space, but get a, a slightly smaller plant because sometimes they grow bigger than what they say they will on the tag. So if it's three by three, you have a three by three space, well, get something that will grow two and a half by two and a half. Or if it says uh, six by, you have a space six by six, get something that will grow five by five. And that way you don't have to prune. Because if you don't have the right measurements, you're going to commit yourself to us every season having to prune. And you shouldn't have to do that with all the, the selection out on the market. And and some people will just go in and go, 50% off, grab it, hun. And that's not, not the answer to the situation. I love that, Joey. Um, it's so true because a lot of times we waste more money on uh-huh. thinking we're saving money than if we really think smart about how we're going to go about it. And I always like to tell um, students and clients to go to the – garden center regularly without the thought of buying anything. Mm -hmm. Go to look, take your camera, take photos, take photos of the tags and come back home and say, you know what? I think this one here will go really good here. You can hold up your phone and look at the site and say, "Hmm, I think this would really go good here because of the shape of it. That's the other thing you need to think of is the shape of the plant. Is it going to be a weeper? Is it going to be upright? Is it going to be, um, is it going to be just a rounded shrub? You don't want to um, put the wrong shape in the spot that you have. Right. This is a long-term investment, so it shouldn't be a one-hour decision in order to make that long-term, lifelong uh, 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 investment. Uh, and I, I think you're right there, too. Is um, Like when you're buying a tree, it's the same thing. Right. If it's going to last 100 years, you want to make sure that you, it's like you buy your house. You're going right. to live in your house. You want to make sure that it's the right house for you and for your family. And, and, you, don't, especially and, and you don't plant it right up next to the window when it's supposed to get 25 mm-hmm. feet wide. Exactly. That's exactly right. And also you can actually do harm to your home and mm-hmm. your foundation if you plant things too close to the foundation. So it's important that you're really mindful of that as well. So with that being said, um, maybe you maybe you have a shrub or a hedge that you do have to trim or prune for whatever reason maybe you you bought the 50 percent off one or whatever um what is the biggest mistake when when people trim their shrubs and hedges and how can they prevent making those mistakes well the one thing is take a look at the shape of the shrub just like people we all have different shapes and we we have shapes because of our genetic heritage and we need to really marvel at that that's really amazing you know we're all human so we we and we don't all look alike and it's the same thing with plants um when you look at a shrub and you say oh you're you're beautiful but you're shorter um i think i'm going to put you along the walkway because you won't be uh growing over the walkway you're going to stay contained in that spot or if you have a big area and you really want to have uh, an area to be filled go with a larger shrub 
And if you're going to be pruning it, make sure you don't prune it into a meatball because not all shrubs are created equal, just like people. We want to use their best attributes to make your landscape look the best possible way it can, and also to attract a diversity of animals and birds and all different types of species, because the greater the diversity within your garden, the better it's going to be from an uh, insect and disease um, cir stand circumstance. You don't want to have um, all of one thing either. You, you want to make sure that you have a diversity of shrubs as well. So if you're going to be pruning, say, a multi-stemmed shrub like a forsythia, you're going to take out the oldest canes right to the ground. And when you do that, these older stems are going to be much taller than the stems that are uh, shorter. And you're going to pull those out, and you're going to see a smaller shrub within that larger shrub. And it'll have the same beautiful shape, but just smaller. So that's the way you should be pruning, not in the meatball form. Right. Well, Eva, we greatly appreciate the time you've offered us. How can our listeners find out more about you? How can they get that book? They can go to evamonheim.com, and the book is right on the tab on the top. So they can go there, and they can have their choice of how they want to purchase it. There's a lot of different options uh, whether you purchase it through me or whether you purchase it through your favorite gardening store or bookstore. That's the best way to do it. Well, Eva, we thank you for the knowledge you've uh, allowed uh, to have on this few minutes we've been given, uh, not only for Holly and myself, but all of our listeners. And we thank you for that. Oh, thank you so much. And I wish you continued success on your show. Well, we thank you very much for that. And when we come back, it's going to be your garden questions, our garden answers. This is The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show got a question for joey and holly send it via email anytime to garden talk radio at gmail.com you move your lawn sprinklers all over the yard but you always end up putting them in the same spots why not just bury them there out of sight always ready to use pre-adjust it to water the precise areas you want quick snap sprinklers makes it easy in-ground sprinklers without the hassle or expense of laying pipe put the sprinklers anywhere in your lawn or garden snap on a hose to supply the water water on it pops up water off it drops below ground you can mow right over it you can have a buried sprinkler system up and running in just minutes each quick snap saves thousands of dollars they install in minutes and operate for years visit quicksnapsprinkler.com rinse kit your hose on the go pressurized water at your fingertips without pumping or batteries simply fill from your spigot or sink on your way out to the garden beach or anywhere spray it wash it rinse kit did you know that all flour is not created equal Janie's Mill carefully stone grinds all their certified organic wheat, rye, corn, buckwheat, and heirloom and ancient grains so that you get every bit of taste and nutrition nature intended. Some flowers really are better than others, and you deserve the best. Get it at janiesmill.com. Do your trees look sad? When we here at the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show Gardens have tree and shrub issues, Dr. Jim's is the product we reach for as it is the product that works. It really provides results. Their small batch extra potent blend of readily available nutrients is exactly what your trees, plants, and bushes need to regain their health and stay bug free. It's super easy to use. It feeds the microbes and adds new life to your soil so you can grow stronger plants. Chemical free, environmentally responsible fertilizer, that works. It will put a smile on you and your plants. To find out more about Tree Secret and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D R J I M Z. Dot com. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Blue Ribbon Organics, Naturally Green Products, Ironwood Tool Company, Easy Step Products, Rinse Kit, Soul Brew Kabucha, Wild Delight, Rycon Vitova, Chip Drop, Bailbuster.com. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show, question and answer time. You've got a question? We probably, we might be, we can get you an answer to that question. You can send it on over to GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com, GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com, or you can uh, give us a call. 
toll free, coast to coast, 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-7469. Had a handful of questions come in this week, Holly. We'll see what we can get through the top of the hour. Okay, so it says, uh, if you just keep cutting back the thistles, will the root eventually die, or is this the best, easiest alternative to pulling? Whatever gets rid of the most roots fastest. Well, we had this. We had a similar question last week about thistles, and this is the most organic means, though it can take quite some time in order to eradicate them by continually stressing the plant out, by continually cutting the top of the plant off uh, at to ground level. So... That's the organic way. Here, I'm going to tell you the way to actually the best way to get rid of them and have uh, the removal of them, though it's not organic. You go to your farm store and you get a, a gallon of 2,4-D, which is the broadleaf herbicide, and you spray the thistles, and it doesn't affect the grasses or any uh, non broadleaf. It's a broadleaf, you know, selective, and uh, thistles or any broadleaf plants, it will kill. Uh, within about 48 hours it will suck it down in the roots and it'll kill it so if you're wanting to get rid of a big patch of thistles that works if you want to be selective you can do that and be very selective with the thistles that you're trying to get if you're doing this in your vegetable garden you want to be aware um, that it can potentially toxify the soil read the labels follow the labels <clears throat> but doing the 2,4-D broadleaf herbicide will remove those thistles, whether in their yard. If they're in the yard, it doesn't affect the grass at all. So not organic, but I've used it on the farm. It works great. It does what it's supposed to do, and it will limit a lot, eliminate a lot of the headaches that you have when it comes to thistles. Next question we have here is, uh, where are we at here? I am in Brookfield, Wisconsin. Okay. Hello from Brookfield, Wisconsin. How long can I leave my cabbage and kohlrabi in the garden before I harvest it? Can it go beyond a freeze if I leave them in the garden? Do I cover them with leaves? Also, my marigold seeds, any of four o'clock seeds, where's the best place to keep them? Basement, refrigerator, or garage? Well, we want to go ahead and harvest the cabbage because if the cabbage is kept in the garden too long, and it rains, it will split. It'll just bust right open. So you want to go ahead and remove it when the head is firm. Now, whether that's a baseball size or basketball size, you want to go ahead and remove it, put it in the crisper of the fridge, or if you've got like a, a chilled basement, you can keep it there. Uh, the kohlrabi, the same thing. You don't want to leave it out there too long because it will get woody and pr basically inedible. With the seeds, you can keep them in an envelope once they are dry, write it on an envelope, and put it in the crisper of your fridge. And they will be fine there. You want to keep them chilled, not frozen. Um, and that will work uh, that way without any issue at all. So go ahead and harvest your produce. You don't want to leave it in the garden too long uh, because it will uh, not not be happy. Uh, so that's that. Okay, next question here, Holly. My butternut squash, which I have harvested, looked fine when I brought it inside. But after about three weeks, I begin to notice brown Bray, uh, and brown and gray patchy scabby areas and I want to and discolored areas what is this is it edible or should I toss it in the trash we actually had this yes. issue it's uh, I don't know a few, a few years ago it's called black rot and it's a fruit rot phase of the gummy stem it's actually like a blight and it's you, you get those black um, dark spots on the the uh, the fruit uh, or the the, the skin on the skin of the yeah on the skin and it's not just butternut squash there's other plants in which this is uh, vulnerable too right it seems to affect um all uh circuit bits curcubits bits curcubits, bits yeah. curcubits. bits um so that includes like what's it called um cucumbers, cucumbers pumpkins thank you. spaghetti pumpkins, squash yeah, yeah. Um, it is. I forget, is it, it, it is edible. It is right? edible. You now, can if you feel it hard right. away, yeah. Now, if you see this, uh, if you see things inside of the the fruit that is not normal, toss it. But it's it's only basically skin deep. Peel it off. You can go ahead and use those first. And the ones that are not showing that discoloration, that scabbiness, that that patchy look on the on the actual butternut squash in this instance, those will store longer. But use the ones that are. Um, getting damaged first but it, it is edible and you don't have uh, there's nothing to be concerned with it's it's really a, a problem when there was too much water it sucked up too much water and didn't really have nowhere to go with it and it kind of started causing issues with the skin of the plant so 
uh, of of the fruit itself. So that that's there. Um, real quickly, when is it too late to plant? Uh, plant to <laughs> when is it too late to plant fall bulbs? Well, as long as the ground can be worked, you can plant them. Many people think frost, freeze, and snowfall. Your planting is over. That's simply not true. You can plant daffodil bulbs. Um, or, or tulip and daffodil bulbs all the way up until the end of January. As long as the soil can be m- dug up and that into the depth in which those bulbs can be is recommended to be planted, go ahead and put them in the ground. You will do just fine. Well, with that being said, we are out of time, and we certainly thank you for yours. Did you miss any portion of the program today or would like to revisit it? Send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. We'll send you a link to that to this program, or you can find it at our parent website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, under the Season 5 tab at the top of the page. Join us next week when we're going to be talking about ornamental grasses, why you may want them, and what you need to be aware of when purchasing them, as well as the history of canning. And our guest will be author Carly McGuire, and we'll answer your garden questions. So until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.